Good afternoon, everyone. Come on and stand with us. Glad y'all are here with us. Praise the Lord. Father, we welcome you in this place. You are worthy of our praise. I was lost in shame, could not get past my blame till he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me. Darkness held me down. Jesus pulled me out. I'm no longer bound. I'm so glad he saved me. See, I of life? Yes, amen. You can be seated. If your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you should be saying hallelujah. Starting Thursday, November 18th, our women's... Welcome to Bayou Blue Assembly. Starting Thursday, November 18th, our women's ministry Bible study. Come and join us as we study Defined. For those attending the Influence Conference, please meet at Bayou Blue Assembly's parking lot at 9.30 a.m. on Friday. Bring money for lunch on the way and the concession stand at the conference. See you there. Attention JBQ team. We have practice next Sunday, November 21st at 4.30. 
Laser Tag All Nighter, Saturday, December 4th from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. for ages 11 to 18. Visit Realm for more info and make sure to register today for a discounted price. Our November Family Service will be on the 28th at 2 p.m. We look forward to all gathering. Our ushers are going to come up and you can also give online at our Realm app. And I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of information. First off, I want to say thank you to everyone who gave last Sunday. How many of y'all remember what last Sunday was? Mission Sunday. Mission Sunday. That's right. And with this that we're going through, I just thank you all for giving because, you know, it says in his word to give our tithes and our offering. And if we want to be blessed, that's what we have to do, especially in this season that we're, like, we're, we're in. Giving our tithes and our offering is uh, one of the best things that you can do. It's the basis. Of, the tithing is just the basis of what God uh, tells us to give. And that's 10%, right? We get to keep the 90. But then when we give our offerings to God, that's when he pours his blessings out. And I think it was very interesting that this uh, week I was reading in Romans 15, and Paul talks about how he stopped. He was going to stop at Jerusalem to give them an offering that was taken up by believers in Macedonia. Isn't that cool that people in the Bible took up offerings to give to people? And uh, that's what we did last week. And I just want to tell you how much we gave. Y'all can wait. We're going to pass this offering in just a minute. We, we gave $24,846 last week. That's what you did. That's what you gave, $24,000 in the time that we're going to. So we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Speed the Light, you giving to that with Brian and Packy's ice challenge stuff and all that, $10,000 came in for that. $10,000, and then BGMC, which is our kids, $3,200 came in for BGMC with a total of $38,046 for missions. That's not counting what the thrift store does, and that's not counting what everybody gives on, on the side or what our church gives. That's just what you have given, $24,000 uh, for that Sunday, $10,000 with the youth with Speed the Light, and the, the thirty two with the BGMC. So thank you so much for giving. Amen. Give yourself a hand. You deserve it. Amen. So let's pray over this offering right now. Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives and the lives of many, many people. And Lord, we thank you that we can give into your kingdom, Lord, our tithes and our offering. And it is promised to us that you rebuke the devourer in our behalf whenever we are faithful to give our tithing and our offering. Even Jesus said to do this in his word, in our New Testament. Do this. You don't forget the other things, but do your tithing also. So thank you, Father, that we can tithe into your kingdom and for the offering. It's a part of our worship, and we give you the glory and the honor and the praise as we do that this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. They're going to go ahead and pass, but while they're passing, I just would like to recognize any veterans in the house. We want you to stand because it was Veterans Day. If you are a veteran, stand up. Come on, we got some more. Anybody else? All right, thank you for your service to the kingdom of God. Thank you so much for your service. Praise the Lord. All right, I asked Brother Dwayne. I don't know where he went. He was just right there. There he is. <laughs> How many of y'all know they went to Africa? Dwayne, Carla, Ian, Brother Greg, and Brennan ended up there, too. They went two weeks. But, of course, we can't have all of them testify. So I just wanted Brother Dwayne to come up and give you a Because, Brother Greg, you talk way too long. We'd be here for two hours. <laughs> so I wanted Brother uh, Dwayne to come and share a little bit about Africa. Yeah, she knows I'll keep it short and sweet. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say thank you for all the support and prayers from everybody here in the church. And uh, we were gone for a whole month, and uh, it just went by so quick because we were just on the move constantly from kids' crusades to youth conferences to Carla and Shereen preaching in 20-something different churches. We had two teams go into the bush four days each team, so those eight days in the bush. So we were on the move constantly, and we had like 1,440 people gave their lives to Christ during that month. And we, we saw many, many wonderful miracles, but Janet just wanted me to tell one story, and it was... Uh, 
I happened to be part of, the, of that team that was, went out on a Saturday afternoon. It was the last BOMA we had stopped in. And we gave the gospel message to, I don't know, it was eight or ten people. And they had an old guy there that when we got there, he jumped up and he, he took off running to his BOMA to get us a chair to sit in, but I, I noticed he had stumbled over the rock and he was waving his stick in front of him. So I'm thinking, this guy's probably blind. So after we gave the gospel message, we asked people if they would like some prayer that God could heal them. And uh, he, of course, stood forward and came forward and said he was blind. And when I noticed his eyes, one eye was completely shriveled up and sunken into the socket. The other eye was completely glazed over. He was totally blind. So we prayed for him the first time. And when he opened his eyes, he had the biggest grin like a little kid at Christmas time. But he said he could just see light and, and, and shapes, but he was happy. He was, it was, almost, you know, just, he was, it was incredible. So we prayed one more time because we wanted to see a total healing. But uh, we left there with the same, you know, the same thing. And uh, he wanted to know, since he got saved, where could he attend church at? So we told him where the nearest church was, and it was a good hour's walk for him. So the next morning, I, d I wasn't a part of the team that went to that particular church, but some other people were, that went came back and was telling us the story that this same guy that stumbled over a rock going to his boma to get us a chair had walked an hour to church because his eyes were completely healed. God had given him a new set of eyes. I put pictures up on Facebook in case, you know, you can go and look it up. So that's short enough, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. They've got lots of stories because they were gone a month. But imagine that. If you're, if you're feeling down and you're thinking God don't, it's not doing anything, maybe you're not praying the right prayers, you know? Maybe you need to pray some, some, uh, out-of-the-box prayers, some miracle-working prayers, God. Do some miracles in our life and maybe laying hands on people and believing for those things because that's what happens when you go over there. And I feel like a lot of times in America, we a little, oh, I'll pray for you, but you not really, you know, I'm going to pray for you. That's why if I tell you I'm going to pray for you, I'm normally going to pray for you right at that moment. We're going to stop. If it's in the middle of Walmart or Rouse's or wherever it's going to be, and we're going to pray. So invite someone to church with you next Sunday. Pray for somebody this week. Be Jesus this week for somebody in our city. They need it. Don't be afraid to encourage them. And then if you want to hear some testimonies, they got more. So invite them for coffee or whatever and, let it, and listen to what God done for them in Africa. Amen. Stand with us. Maybe turn around and greet someone this morning and love on them. Say, hey, I'm glad you're here this Sunday.
so good to us. Amen. You've been so faithful to us. You've led us through the fire. You led us through the storms and you've never forsaken us, God. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that right here in this service this morning, you are here with us in the midst. Father, we thank you for your presence that you touch hearts and lives in this place and let them let everyone know that they are not alone here <laughs> and that you are so good to us we celebrate you today i love you lord for your mercy never fails me oh I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. It's running out 
Before you leave this place, I hope you will know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and for me, for our sins, because we were sinners, our sinners, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that he shed for you and for me, we can be made whole by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus. 
his name. Amen. Oh, give him a hand clap of praise. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Y'all may be seated. It is so good to be in church with my people, my family. You know, we're in the Thanksgiving season. Sometimes we, we forget how much we need to be thankful for. You know, how many of y'all know sometimes when you're going through stuff, you forget about being thankful and just think about being whiny. Because it ain't this didn't happen, and God, this didn't happen, and God, this didn't happen. Instead of us doing that, how about we think about the things God has done? Amen. I, I believe that we have more reason to be thankful than we do to be complaining. Now, Brother Greg could tell you, my, my wife's hard on you, brother, I'm going to tell you. He could tell you of the hurt and the heartache and the pain of the people that you meet in Africa that don't have anything and are as happy as they can be. When you introduce them to Jesus, they realize they've just gained eternity. See, that's what you got to understand. It, it's, you know, you may lose everything in this world, but if you gain heaven, don't you know it's worth it? Amen. We're going to start a new series today. It's Soul Winning Warriors. And I took, uh, I, some of y'all say, well, I thought I've heard that before. You, you may have. It was several years ago. God put this on my heart. I, I preached this. It was 20, 27 years ago that God gave this to me. I put it in an a, a envelope and a shelf and put it in my filing cabinet. And then several years ago, God brought it back to me and said, preach it. And I preached it and put it back in there. And God told me, I want you to take it out and I want you to preach it again. So this is SAVED Soul Winning Warriors. The uh, SAVED is an acronym for Saints, Armed, Victorious, Educated, and Determined. And it deals with our uh, obligation and responsibility to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost and the dying. And so I want us to understand, first off, is the mentality that we have to have if we're going to be soul winners. If you're going to win lost people for Jesus, you better get off a wimp uniform and put on a warrior's vest. Amen? You're not going to win people to Jesus being a whiner. You're not. You're not going to win people to Jesus complaining and being bitter about your life ain't all you want it to be. Come on, somebody. You know what? You may have to go through a little bit of tough times to show other people what it looks like to be a Christian and go through tough times. I mean, if we act just like the world acts and whine just like the world whines and complains just like the world complains, what's the difference? 
See, the church ought to be the one saying, you know what, I, I'm, I'm walking through this muddy field, but I know on the other side of it, God's going to meet me there because he told me that if I would follow him, he'd be there. And so I'm, he's directed my path. He's the one who has set me down this road. Do you, do you always like the road God sets you down? No. Do you always like the, the junk you got to wade through to get to the other side? No. But it's always worth it when you get to where God called you to be. Because when you get to where God called you to be, there is power, there is anointing, there is an ability to do what you could not do before. Something is left inside of us. And so there's some scriptures. I I didn't give them to to Miss Hannah. This is my fault, not hers. Because I gave her the scriptures I'm going to be preaching with later, not the ones I'm going to tell you all about right in this moment. So I want you to understand being a warrior. When you came to church and became a Christian, you joined the army of God, right? You did not join a social club. Come on. You didn't join some place where you can gather together with people who are just like you, who think like you, act like you, and talk like you. You joined a place that is recruiting from every aspect of our world, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it all. Come on, y'all. Isn't it good to know that you can look around this place and see people who come from another background rather than your background so we know? Because I'm going to tell you, there are people I will never be able to reach because they're not going to look at me and think, I want to hear him. But there are those people that will listen to you who won't listen to me and people that will listen to me who won't listen to you. God didn't draw an army of, of clones. He drew an army of individuals so that we could come together and go to war in the kingdom of God so that lost humanity might be saved so that the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary wouldn't be for a handful of somebody but that Jesus Christ died that whosoever would receive him might be saved. And so we want to understand that we are, are in this army and, and we have to understand that, that when you go out and tell people about Jesus, there is resistance. Has, has anybody noticed that? That when you try to tell somebody about the love of God, there's always something trying to distract I know that when the uh, SUM would go down to Bourbon Street and they would minister and and try to tell people about Jesus, there's always something going on to distract. So they had a a strategy. They would have two or three people watching while one's testifying. And anytime something would come to distract, one of them would take that distraction and, and, and keep them from stopping the spreading of the gospel. Why? Because there was a war going on. Can I tell you that the devil shows up on Bourbon Street through his people. When God's people show up to share the gospel, the devil shows up to interrupt the gospel. I know that because some of our young SUMers were down there and this uh, demon-possessed person looked at them and said, this is your middle name. This is your favorite color. And shocked them. I asked, why were you shocked? Well, that they knew that. I said, you don't know that there are familiar spirits? Those familiar spirits are the spirits that attack. How many of y'all know the devil's trying to kill you? He, he, he don't take weekends off. Come on. He's after you 24-7, 365. The devil is knocking on your door trying to trip you up. And, and he's, he's been following you doing that most of your life. And so he, the devil's just doing everything that he can. You encounter somebody else who's full of the devil. That devil talks to that devil. And they begin to exchange information. See, but when I stand in the power of Almighty God, the devil cannot stand in the presence of God. But he's got to bow and back up and move away. And if you're not understanding that there's a war going on. The devil will back you down and push you away. So we have to understand that we were, were baptized into this faith, is into the war to be ready to battle against spiritual forces that are holding captive the hearts of your loved ones. That's right. It's the devil that's blinded the eyes of them that don't believe. He's blinded them to the truth of what God's doing. Have you ever wondered how people could know who you are and what you did and how you lived and now they see you as a Christian and don't want to get saved? Some of y'all, Terry, were bad. (laughs) 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Most of y'all wouldn't know who I was talking about, but I looked right at him when I said something. Some of us, if we look about the life that we lived before Christ, Ian, we think about what, what people would look at that and they would think, well, you know, that person should be disqualified from being used by God. Look how bad they are. But the devil says, if they get a hold to God, they're going to mess me up. So what I have to do is distract and tear away. I've got to get their eyes off God and get godly people away from them because there's a danger that if they get a hold of the power of Almighty God, they're going to mess up the kingdom of hell because they're going to bring light into darkness and they're going to see deliverance among the captive. That's what happens when the power of God rises up inside of his children. Demons flee. But that ain't because we wimpy Christians. Now, there's a difference between standing your ground and being a jerk. There are those that go to Bourbon Street that their entire ministry is about telling people they're going to hell. And pointing out the obvious sins that they're in. How many of y'all understand that pointing out people's sins is not the gospel of Jesus Christ? Oh, come on, somebody. I didn't need anybody to tell me where I, my eternity was going to be. I knew where I was going when I died. And I used to tell them. And I'd send them ahead of me if they didn't leave me alone. Because I, I had a bad attitude about stuff. But, but, but the gospel is not that they're not going to make heaven. The gospel, the good news, is that even though you don't deserve heaven, Jesus died so you could go to heaven. Amen. There's the gospel. Ephesians 6, 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Y'all, there is an enemy that we're at war with, and we have to be soul-winning warriors. That means we have to go out and we have to break the strongholds of hell. I've got to bind up the enemy that has raised itself above the knowledge of God. I've got to let something on the inside of me determine that I will not let the devil take another soul that I see. I will not back away from what the devil is trying to scare me and intimidate me. I'm not going to take my eyes off what God's called me to be. I'm not going to look at the situations that I'm in. I'm not going to look at the difficulties I'm facing. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus, and I'm going to know in whom I have believed and that he is able to keep what I've committed to him. Let me tell you something. I have committed to God the souls of the people that I love. And there's a lot of them that you can't tell the difference because <laughs> they hadn't changed one bit. Come on, y'all. I've been praying for them. I've been claiming their souls, but they just still look like the devil. That's okay, because the devil don't get to win, because I refuse to let go, because I, I'm wrestling against spiritual things, not physical things. I don't know if y'all know this, but people can do really dumb stuff. I know that shocks some of y'all. I, I, I see it. People can make decisions that you look at them and go, you just want to have a bad time, don't you? I mean, you're just looking to mess your life up. No. -uh. And they make really bad choices. And we wonder, how can that be? It's because the enemy has blinded them. The enemy has lied to them. The devil has convinced them that the church is the enemy. They, how many of y'all know sinners that won't come to church because the church hates them? That's garbage. The church, the individuals who aren't saved might. Uh-uh, uh-oh. The church loves because Jesus loves. We're not representing us. We're representing him. And if you're, a lo if you're not living the way that you should live, you're not representing Christ very well. Because you can't go into a battle against the devil in your own power and win. 
Because it's a spiritual battle, and the devil will beat you every time if you go after him alone. But you go after him in the name of Jesus. Demons got to bow. They have to flee. We have to understand that, that the enemy will cause us to stumble and fall. But when I know God, Romans 8, 37, nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So, so I know that in my life that I'm going to have to battle this enemy who's trying to keep me from being a soul-winning warrior. See, the devil wants me to put myself in a situation where I have to say, well, I can't tell him about God now because look what I messed up. It quits being about Jesus and starts being about you. Can I tell you, <laughs> it ain't about you. It's not about how good you are or how bad you are. It's not about the fact that, oh, I had a good day today. I can pray for somebody. Do you think somehow that your goodness qualifies you for supernatural power? It is your surrender to God that allows you the ability to step out and do anything for God. It is you surrendering your will to his will that when he says speak, you speak. When he says be quiet, you be quiet. When he says get up and go, you get up and go. When he says stay, you stay. You do what God wants you to do, not what you want to do. That's a surrendered life. That's a life that has been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I don't live it for me, I live it for him. That's where we have to come to. We have to understand that we are soldiers in the army of God. And our number one obligation is to reach lost people for Jesus. That's what you're called to do. And in the process of that, James says, pure religion, undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to, to visit the fatherless and the widows on their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's pure, undefiled religion is to love people and keep yourself from sin. How many of y'all know I can't keep you from sin? I can't keep you from watching a dirty show on TV. I can't list, keep you from listening to filthy music on the radio. I can't keep you from doing drugs or, or getting drunk and passed out. I can't keep you out of jail. I can't keep you out of prison. I can't keep your tongue civil. I can't keep you and your spouse happy. I, I can't do that. I can pray for you. I can give you advice, but I can't do it for you. And you know what? If I want my house to be what God wants it to be, you can't come in and, and speak over my house and make it what it's supposed to be. i got to make a choice. It's time to be responsible for you. You say, yeah, but pastor, you don't know what I live with. No, I don't. But I know the God, if you're saved, that lives with you. I know the anointing and the power of God that rises up when you do what you're supposed to do. I know what God can do. I know that because I can promise you right now, I wasn't raised saved. My mom and daddy tried everything they could to get me to live right. My, every time my daddy preached against something I hadn't tried, I tried it. I was determined I was not going to be a preacher. I was not going to be a preacher's kid. And I wouldn't have gone to church that had given me a choice. I never had a choice. It was you get up and go to church. If I don't want to go to church, well, then let me know where you're moving. Because you ain't staying here. I'm, you know, you're seven years old. Where are you going to go? <laughs> so, you know, you go to church. That's how I grew up. Some of y'all like that. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. They didn't say, hey, would you like to go to church today or you want to just hang out here? Psh, get up. I'm tired. I don't care. Go to bed early next Saturday. My mom and daddy wouldn't take no excuse. I told my daddy, I said, I feel sick. He said, good, we'll pray for you at church. You'll get better. <laughs> uh-huh. And, and when we started the church, all I'd do is walk downstairs because church was in our living room. They took my TV away from me, put pews in the living room and a, and a pulpit and hollered at me. Because I know that's talking about me every time they preached. You say, yeah. No, no, no. I'm telling you. They looked right at me and, and preached. They was talking to me. 
And so here we are. I, I, I had this adversity against church because I heard everybody told me, Packy, you're going to hell if you don't change. Packy, you're going to hell. Packy, you're... I thought that was the gospel. I found out the gospel is I don't have to. That if I'll reach out to where Jesus is, he can save me and I can, I can make heaven. Amen. And so that's the gospel so that I understand that I'm, a, I'm becoming a soldier. Now, now I'm getting to my message. Y'all don't think I'm not getting to my message. I hadn't forgot where I'm at. But we going, it's going to be a series. So y'all go, y'all okay. Y'all take a breath. Whew. Yeah, I'm not doing all the other ones in one Sunday. Y'all, y'all good. Okay. But I want you to understand if you're a Christian, Right? So you know whether you're a Christian or not. If you don't know, come see me after church, and I'll, I'll explain to you. Because sometimes people don't understand. We use terminology sometimes, and, and I came out of Catholicism. First part of my life, I was raised, I was an altar boy, and, and I went through that process. And, and so, so for, for me, the change from Catholicism to, to full gospel Pentecostal crazy people. <laughs> Any, anybody regulate to what I'm talking about? I mean, I'm telling you, the first Pentecostal preacher I heard, I thought he was possessed by something. <laughs> he was the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know that. That dude's jumping and shouting and running, and I'm thinking, good, something's wrong with this guy, Daddy. <laughs> Daddy said, don't turn your back on him, son. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, we didn't, and I'd never been around that, and, and I remember the, the power of God is shaking, and, and I remember growing up some of those services, and, and they're preaching about, about commitment to Christ, about selling out to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when I talk about becoming a Christian and living a Christian life, I'm talking about a life surrendered to God, a life that says no to sin and yes to the Word of God. When I find in the Bible that it says don't do this, as a Christian, I don't do it. I don't debate with God about how come I can't do what's fun. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but after that comes judgment. How many of y'all know what the judgment of drugs and alcohol is? It's not talking about death. There's a whole lot of punishment this side of the grave. And so God tries to warn you not to get into that mess because he knows the end of that. Every way of a man seems right in his own eyes, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's what the Bible says. And so as a Christian, I have committed myself to following Christ every day. So, so that's what we're, talk, we're talking about now, being part of the army of God now, we had some veterans here today that, that stood. Uh, can you imagine as you were in active duty and your superior officer says, I want you to go and do this, look at them and say, nah, I don't feel like it right now. I'll get somebody else. That probably wouldn't have gone over very well. And so how often, though, do church people tell God, I just don't want to do that. It's not how I feel. I don't feel like that. I, I used to you know, tell my, 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 my friends we talk about because it depended on what church you went to and what you could get to do. So if you wanted to feel good about yourself, you could go to certain churches that allowed certain stuff. Right? Because some of them don't mind you get drunk. They, they don't. Some don't mind adultery. You can go to some churches, they'll tell you, man, you know, God loves you no matter what you do. Just do what you want to do just as long as you show up pay tithe. I'm going to be in that church. You know what the problem with that is? Those churches don't get to go to heaven. Coming to church don't make you a Christian. A relationship with Jesus makes you a Christian. Amen? A lot of people think, well, I went to church. Or not. So what? Devil shows up at church every Sunday. Come on, somebody. He does. He shows up to mess with us. Sometimes he jumps in the sound booth. He's always in the choir loft. Y'all know that. The Bible says. As music started with the devil. Come on, somebody. We, we see this, but, but here I am in Timothy 2 in verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. 
That's what I want us to look at. Look at that. What are you entangled with that's keeping you from being a good soldier for Jesus? Because, see, we're going to talk about reaching lost, going to war for somebody's soul. And that is so odd. Some of y'all are going, what are you talking about going to war for somebody's soul? That sh- it should be the oddity that we don't understand that. See, because I was in bondage. I was bound by sin. Anybody here bound by sin in your life ever been so overcome with the sin that had a hold of you that you could not imagine your life without it? See, some of y'all say, no, I've never done. I I can. I remember thinking, if I quit doing this, what will I get to do? What's the purpose in life if I can't have these things? This is what fun is. This is joy. This is my life. Well, I can't give up all this because I was blinded. My soul was in bondage, and I didn't know it. But praise God for believers who stood in the gap for me and prayed that God would shine a light into my heart and show me the truth so that I could be set free from this this blindness of sin so that I could know all that God had for me, and I couldn't even see it because I was blind by the enemy. But there were those soul-winning warriors. There were those people that I look back to and I'm so thankful that they love me beyond my smart mouth. Yeah, some, some, some of y'all are saying, oh, yes, Jesus. Some of, y'all, some of y'all know, had it not been for the grace of somebody standing in the gap for you, you'd still be in the world on your way to hell. You know that. See, I know I would. I wouldn't have stumbled into the church. It was purposed in me not to come to church. I made a purpose. Some, some of y'all grew up in church, didn't have a choice. When you had a choice, you quit coming. Anybody besides me? I'm, on, I'm the only devil raised in church. Come on. Come on. Okay, thank y'all. Some of y'all helping me out in here. Some of y'all trying to hang me out to dry. No, never, Pastor. We love church. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And what happens? The devil says you're not worthy. You know the thoughts you've had. You know the things you've been involved in. You don't deserve God. And everybody in that church knows how dirty you really are. And you know they're talking about it's behind your back. You know they don't really care about you. They'd be better off and you'd be better off. You usually go find someplace else to hang out because you're never going to make it anyway. The devil ever tell you that? Can I tell you he's a bald-faced liar? That's not the truth. The devil don't get to write my truth because he's a liar. But you know what? It takes somebody. It takes somebody that is willing to take a stand and say, I'm ready to go to war for somebody else's soul. I don't have to battle every morning. I don't have to get up and battle the devil so I'll serve God every day. I'm going to get up and go to war against the enemy for somebody else's soul because I'm serving God. You see, I've, I've done enlisted in this army, and I've done made up my mind that, that I'm going to go to war, and I'm going to fight for what's right, and I'm not going to stand for God just because it's convenient, but I'm going to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the only hope this world has. And I've made a decision for me that if I lose everything but gain heaven, it's okay. If I don't have anything left in this world when I, when I shed the, the, the garments and go away, I used to tell my, my kids, I, I don't care what they do. If I have anything left, they can have it. I don't, care. I don't care if they throw me in a ditch somewhere when I'm dead. I'm dead, and I'm gone. I ain't, that shell, this old thing that carries me around, I beat it up so bad over the years, it don't really matter. What matters to me is the souls of the ones dying and going to hell around me. It's my family members and it's my loved ones that are blinded and held captive by the lies of hell that I've got to make a decision inside of myself that I'm not going to be a pity party for me about wanting what I want. God, do this for me and I'll do this for you. But instead, I'm going to say, God, if it costs me everything in this world, I'll fight to the death for this soul you put on my heart. God, whatever it takes, I will fast and I will pray and I will war. And God, I will more than any 
anything else, not just die to see them saved. God, I will live in such a way that they will want you in their life too. This is the first thing that we have to do is we have to be willing to live for God. Dying for God's easy. I mean, bam, you're gone. Right? So, oh, I would die for my faith. How about living for it for a little while first? Huh? How about instead of just saying, well, if they kill me, I won't deny Christ. Well, will you deny him in your lifestyle? Uh-oh. Would you deny him in your words? Oh, you don't have to say, I deny Christ, but when God begins to tell you to go and you won't go, what are you doing? You're denying him. You're denying him the lordship in your life by saying no to him instead of yes. See, when we deny Christ, there's more than one way to deny our faith. Another way to deny your faith is God says, I want you to tell this person about me. And we say, no, God, that's not for me. Send somebody else. You have just denied him as the Lord and Savior of your life, and now you become in charge. Y'all, let's don't do that. Let's make a decision that we have come into the army of God and we're ready to not only give our lives in the service of God, but to live our lives in the service of God. To stand up and, and, and take the hard hit when someone's mad about God and, and griping and complaining about church instead of sitting back and not saying anything because I didn't want to start something. Stand up and say, you know what? If all you people in the world were perfect, let me talk about some of y'all. Let's talk about that man down the street that's a drunk and beats his wife. You know what? Is that okay? Well, no. Well, you know, you want to talk about the church isn't perfect. Well, you know what? The church isn't perfect because it's a bunch of imperfect people in the church. We're not talking about us being perfect. We're talking about lifting Jesus higher than us. Submitting ourselves to God and saying, it doesn't matter if I mess up. That isn't God messing up. That's me. I've told people so often when they say, well, you know, I said, look, don't look at me and follow God. Follow God, I'm going to mess up. I'm not going to be everything that I should be, and I promise you, somewhere along the way, I'm going to let you down. I hate that, but you're going to be unreasonable. <laughs> it doesn't matter, y'all. No one can live up to all the expectations of everybody around us. It just, it, and, and the devil makes sure of that because he wants you to look at people instead of Jesus. Because can I tell you, Jesus never lets you down. Amen. Ever. He may not give you what you want, but a lot of times you want what you shouldn't have. It's God's protecting you. So here we are. I think about David's mighty men. I mean, you can go into, uh, into Kings and Chronicles and and look at David's mighty men of valor. There were three that were beast. I'm telling you, Ken, those dudes were beast mode, baby. Killing 800 people with a sword by himself. 800. His, his hand cramped. So if any of y'all have ever worked out, you, you, you get a cramp and it locks your hand closed. His hand locked around that sword. He couldn't let go of it. He said, all right, well, I'll just go killing people. We had a man that stood and drew a line and said, you know what? I'm not backing up. The enemy keeps coming down and stealing our food. My kids are hungry. My wife don't have what she needs. My community's falling apart. I'm not letting the devil steal from me anymore. They drew that line. One man stood against an army and won because God fought on his side. We know about Benaiah that went into a pit after a lion on a snowy day. That's crazy. If you've ever seen a real lion, you know that. I'm not talking about one in a zoo they got behind bars. I'm talking about one walk around going, what, you want some? That's how they walk on the plains. You, you, you want some of us? Come here. Got lots of us. Little you. You don't want to, you don't want to mess with them. And so we, we have to decide, are we going to be the kind of warriors that are ready to step out? David said, boy, if I could just have a drink of the water from, from Bethlehem, from the well, man, it would refresh me so much. Three of his guys broke through the enemy lines, fought, risked their lives to bring David a drink from that well. Ready to give everything so that their leader could have what he wanted. David was so moved that he poured the drink offering out. He said, there's no way I can drink that. It would be like drinking the blood of you men. 
He said that my selfishness caused y'all to do that. I'll never do that again. But he poured it out before them. But those men, those mighty men, were willing to give everything to, be, to, to do what he needed. Y'all, we need to be that kind of warriors in the kingdom of God. We need to make a decision that, that we're going to do everything that God wants us to do, that we're going to draw lines across the battlefield and refuse to move any longer. There's too many people who are dying and going to hell in our community, in our family, people in our own church that are battling with their faith. We need to draw that line. We're going to talk about saints next week. We're going to talk about what it is to be a saint. Y'all, I'm not talking about two miracles miracles in a hundred years of death. I'm talking about biblical sainthood. Amen. I'm talking about the Bible's talking about you and he's talking about me, that the word of God was written to the saints at the church. That's the believers. God wants us to understand that this Bible was written for you to have power and might and anointing so that the devil rise up against you. He finds that there's a bigger God in you than there's outside of you. Amen. That that's the God. That's the God that we serve today. Soul winning warriors. Let me tell you something. If you're going to reach the lost, you got to get into that warrior mentality. It's got to be that you understand that there are going to be res resistance. How many of y'all have ever been told, I don't want to hear what you got to say? How many of you have ever said, I don't want to hear what you got to say? <laughs> now, some of us have done both. I've told people I didn't want to hear it. And I've been told I did, they didn't want to hear it. Both sides of the, of the thing. And can I tell you, when I told some of those guys I didn't want to hear it and they kept on telling me anyway, I was mad at them. But it deep in here, I knew what they were telling me was out of love and not con condemnation. They weren't trying to make me feel bad. They were trying to tell me that there was a better way. They were trying to tell me that I didn't have to live in the bondages of this life, but I couldn't believe them. You know, Brother Sullivan, I couldn't believe them. I, I lived there too much. I lived in those bondages for too long. How was God going to be able to take that away from me? I couldn't see it. I couldn't believe for it. But they, they shine the light of truth in love into my heart. And I, all of a sudden, I believed I could. I believed that I could be different, not because of me, but because of Jesus. But it was because there were some people that came, stood between me and the devil. And they shined a lot of God into my life. And I could clearly see what I needed to see. Y'all, there are people everywhere around you in darkness. Janet, you can come. I think about 9-11 quite often because I was so moved that day. I don't know about y'all. How many of y'all can remember where you were and what you were doing that day? I had brought about 600 pounds of shrimp to Gina from my brother's church. And so I would left. Uh, it was after a Wednesday night, I guess it was. Right, it was a Sunday night. After a Sunday night service, I loaded up my shrimp and I took off. I got up there, you know, of course it was late getting in. And so I was kind of sleeping in. And, and I heard Eddie say, Packy, get up. America's under attack. I jumped up and said, what are you talking about? And I walked into the living room to watch the second plane hit the tower. And, and, and my heart sunk. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. And here I, I got to sell this shrimp because I, I didn't pay for it out of my money. <laughs> and, I, and, and I'm thinking, I ain't going to place a store that much shrimp at my house. So I'm selling shrimp as fast as I can. Hearing these reports are coming out. But one of the things that, that, that I remember watching live, I, how many of y'all remember the scenes, people running from the, the trade centers in panic and fear and, and anguished looks? But then I saw the back of people's heads running the other way. They were running into those buildings. Rescue workers and firemen and policemen that were running right into that building that's burning up and on fire. I'm thinking, what are they doing? They were going to find those people that were trapped. There were people that couldn't get out who were going to die and go to hell. And they were going to die in those buildings. They were, they were going, to, going to just sit there. And they knew that, that somebody had to go find them. 23 of one of the rescue teams 
members that I haven't had at my house somewhere now or, or it's at y'all's house. I don't remember where it's at. 23. 23 men and women who gave their lives saving other people's lives. On a day they could have stayed out of the buildings and lived. But they would run into those stairwells and climb up a one floor at a time and they'd step in there was no electricity no lights no windows and they would holler is anyone here and they would be quiet and in the darkness they'd hear somebody say yes come come follow my voice follow the light and people would come they were just sitting there in the darkness not moving didn't know what to do afraid fear so gripped them that they sat there in the darkness and not knowing what to do God showed me that's the world. That's the lost. They're sitting down in their sin and they're afraid and they don't know what to do. They're waiting for somebody to bring the light. Somebody to cry out, is anybody there? And when they say, yeah, say, I, I come to this, come to the light, come to faith, come to Christ. He'll get you out of here alive. I believe that's the call That is the direction, that is the message over the next few weeks we're going to hear. Are you that voice crying out in the darkness for the truth, for the lost to find hope again, for the blind to receive their sight, for for the families that are falling apart to be drawn back together under faith in Christ Jesus? I believe that God wants his army to hit the streets, to tell our families, to look them in the eye when they say, I don't need that, and challenge that lie. Yes, you need God. This world's falling apart, and so will you without God. I have friends of mine would tell me, oh, you know, I don't need church. And I say, no, you're doing pretty good by yourself, huh? Well, of course, their lives were falling apart, and they knew it. And they knew I knew it. And then they'd say stuff like, well, what difference is going to church really going to make? Because look at this person. They're in church, and they do worse than me. And I knew they were telling the truth. What do you say? I tell you what I said. I said, well, okay, then live like you're living, die, and go to hell with them. That makes people mad, Brother Greg. But sometimes, you know, you got to tell some hard truth. You know, you don't want to go to church because there's hypocrites in church. How are you going to feel going to hell with them? There ain't no hypocrites in heaven. There may be some in church, but there ain't some hypocrites in the bar. That's right. Those strippers, they're hypocrites. They don't really like you. They just act like they do get your money. You don't stay away from hypocrites, stay away from, stay away from all of them. See, you're listening to the lie of the devil to stay away from church. Because here's where you can get healed. Here's where you can get delivered. Here's where you can be set free. Here's where you can go from being a hypocrite to being a real Christian. And take a stand and decide, I don't care. If nobody else in the world is going to be real, I'm going to be. I'm going to choose Christ. You say, well, you mean I'll never mess up again? No. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you're forgiven. That's what that means. It means that even when I mess up, there's the grace and the mercy of God that will forgive me and restore me and put me back on the right track. There's going to be a lot of people say, Lord, Lord. He's going to say, I don't even know who you are. Depart from me. They're going to say, hang on just a second, Jesus. I did miracles. Cast out devils. where We raised the dead. And he's going to say, I never knew you. You didn't do it for me. You did it for yourselves. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to fall flat on my face and I'm just going to worship him. And I'm going to trust that his grace is sufficient. I'm going to trust that if I hold on to the hand of Jesus, he's going to guide me through the darkness. That's what I'm doing. Because you know what? There's too many people that need Jesus. There's too many people that are not going to make heaven their home. Some of y'all have been thinking through this whole service of people you know that need to be saved. 
You may be thinking there's some people should have been here to listen to this message. Tell them. Go talk to them about it. Tell them in the next few weeks, Pastor is going to be talking about winning souls for Jesus, beating devils back, getting a hold of the power of God, and letting what God called the church to be, be loosed inside of this church. To watch lost people come home. To watch broken people made whole. To see the power of God unleashed in our community. The devil don't know when to shut up and go home, y'all. And he thought he could just beat the church up and we'd quit. Look around us. Two, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon in a barred building. We scrap him back. We're doing what God called us to do. We're telling the lost people about Jesus. We did a missions all. I'm going to tell you, that was a difficult decision to make, but then it wasn't. To give an entire week's income to missions. That wasn't an easy decision to make in the physical. In, in, we got bills to pay. We got church to rebuild. But in my heart, I felt like God said do it. So we did it. $24,000. In case y'all were wondering, it's one of the best offers we've had since the storm. It is. We're giving it to missions. That's what we're going to do. We haven't dropped any of our missionaries. Haven't had to let go of anything that we're doing. We're holding on to the call of God. Why? Because I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him. But you know what? There's too many people dying and going to hell around us. It's time that we, the church, were about the Father's business. That business is reaching lost people for Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and my prayer team could please come. If you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I am ready to be a soul winning warrior. I am ready to reach out and be used by God. Would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. I see the hands all over. I'm going to ask you all just to stand to your feet if you raised your hand. As so many of you did, I, I just I, I, I want to pray over you. Ready to be used however you want, God. To do whatever you want. Father, you see those hands, you see those hearts, you see those lives. Father, there is so many things that we're battling right now, but God, we understand that everything that we have is yours. That, Lord, anything that's lost was yours lost. Anything that was gained is yours gained. I am yours, and all that I have is yours. So, Father, I'm not going to focus on those things. But, Father, I want to focus on the thing that you focus on. That you so loved the world, you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him, on Jesus, would not perish but have everlasting life. Because you didn't send Jesus to condemn them, but to save them. So, God, I ask that you would help us. Help us, Lord God, to open up our hearts and to be your vessels. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer, I want you to come quickly. We're going to pray for you.